Hello and welcome to Inside the Hive, wherever you're watching around the world. It's Thursday, which means we've got another great show on the way for you this evening. Coming up, we've got another 60-second challenge. Georgie Ferguson taking that on this week. We're going to hear from friend of the show, Gifton Noel Williams, about his new role with the women's team. We're going to add another player to our greatest Watford 11. João Pedro is going to be reflecting on his time so far here at Watford. And of course, it would be remiss of us not to look forward to tomorrow's big game versus Norwich, which of course is Graham Taylor's scarf there as well. So lots of memories about the legend that was Graham Taylor coming up on tonight's show as well. But of course, I can't do this on my own. As always, I'm joined by the legend that is Mr Tommy Mooney. Tommy, how are you? Very good, thanks. Golf this week? No golf. I've even cancelled tomorrow's because we're so busy with tonight's show and the game Busy tomorrow. or is it because it's too cold? It's a little bit cold, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I don't want to get up early with the t early tea time. <laughs> I, I applaud your honesty, Tommy. Uh, we're also joined on the show by another Watford legend this evening who has made an amazing amount of appearances for the club. Uh, 491, seven goals, player of the season in 91-92. It's the legend that is Nigel Gibbs. Uh, Nigel, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, pleasure to have you here with us. Um, a big honour falls upon you this evening. You've got to pick a greatest 11 player. It's going to be a centre-back. Mm -hmm. So a bit of a challenge for you a bit later on in the show, which hopefully you're looking forward to. Yes, I am. Yeah, I mean, I've played with a lot of centre-backs over the years. So, uh, yeah, tough, tough, tough choice. But uh, I'll, I'll give you my choice later on. Yeah, looking forward to that. Looking forward to that. Um, Tommy, Nigel's a bit of a legend right around here. Sir Nigel. <laughs> Even to the players, not just the supporters. Yeah, obviously, we, we, had, we had a great time. We had, it was a good time for the club and a, a couple, couple of years sharing the dressing room. Yeah, so we've had some good times over the years. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're both club ambassadors as well, so I'm incredibly honoured to be sat with a pair of you tonight, both of you, Sir Tommy and Sir Nigel. Um, Nigel, let's talk about your time briefly playing at the club to kick things off. Obviously, you're a Watford boy and, and playing for the club. Was that always an ambition of yours growing up? Yes, I think... Um, you know, when I started training with the club at 11 years of age, obviously from St Albans, that's all I ever wanted to do was was to play for the for the club, and I was fortunate enough to do that. Um, you know, a lot of hard work went into that. Became an apprentice first, and then obviously became a professional. But uh, when you play for the team you supported, it, it makes it even more special. Mm. Um, Tommy, we were speaking about Nigel the other week. Obviously, you're good uh, <laughs> on the show because you made our greatest 11 side mm. a couple Thank of weeks you. ago. Um, an incredible player, you know, and just just. I think just the way he played football, the way he embraced the club, just, just adds all together. It's just a perfect blend for a player. Yeah, that level of loyalty, um, thankfully, hasn't gone unnoticed by the club. But, yeah, Gibbo was always one of those trustworthy people. I'm not just saying it because he's here, but we, we trusted Gibbo. So if we, went out, if we weren't out on a night out, we knew that, Gibbo did, wouldn't have a drink, so the kitty was in safe hands <laughs> <coughs> when it was looked after by Gibbo. When he decided to go home, no idea what happened to it then, because it went to perhaps less trustworthy hands. But Gibbo always looked after the kitty, so we, we're, we're, as a group, we're forever great. <laughs> I love that. We just saw your um, appearance yes. stats drop up in, in comparison to other players that have played. Just one other player ahead of you with most appearances for the club. Um, how important and how special is that for you? Because you see some players, a bit of a journeyman, play for several clubs, but, but this club was home for you. And, and to be on a list with players like that must, must be pretty special for you. Yes, I mean, uh, unfortunately, I had 18 months out with an injury. But, um, you know, when, when you finish your career, you look back on things. Like when, you, when you're actually in it and part of it, you don't really think about it too much. But obviously, when your career finishes, you, you look, back, look back at the games you played, the amount of games... Uh, you know, I, I didn't make many sub appearances, so I actually hold the record for the number of starts, which I'm very proud of that people have reminded me about. So, yeah, it, it's good to look back on. Obviously, Tommy said loyalty in the game now seems to have gone out. Um, you know, I obviously spent 20 years nearly as a player um, and then three years as a coach, but it's, it was it was a great time. And um, I think in those days you didn't move around as much and the club always wanted me to stay. There was a couple of times when possibly I could have moved on, but... You know, I don't regret anything and I had a, had a great career and, and really enjoyed my time here. Mm. And you're still involved in the game now, obviously at the academy and yeah. had a bit brief experience with the, with the first team, of course, uh, last year as well in 2021. And obviously yeah. still loving your football and 
great to be involved with it still. Yeah, that's it. And, um, you know, I love football, um, love to be involved. Uh, I really enjoy the coaching side of things. As you say, I had a very fortunate last year when uh, Jose got sacked at Tottenham. Uh, I got a call from Ryan Mason, who actually I had coached when he was a young boy, but then coached with him a little bit when he was at Spurs, when he unfortunately had to retire. And uh, he said, look, will you come and give me a hand? I've got seven games. Will you, will you come and support me? And I had a really good time. Um, obviously, we, we lost in the final to Man City but uh, won four out of six games so Ryan did a very good job and I thoroughly enjoyed myself working with that calibre of players. Mm. Um, let's talk about your memories of, of being a Watford player. I know there's mostly lots of them mm. that you could pick out but are there one or two that particularly stand out for you? Because of course mm. you were blessed like Tommy to, to be around the legend that is Graham Taylor as well. Yeah, I mean, the boss um, signed me as an apprentice, signed me as a pro and gave me my debut. And, and you never forget that. I mean, I was very fortunate to uh, have a long career, but you, you look back and I can still remember my debut now. I was uh, 18 and three days and we were playing in the UEFA Cup um, against Sparta Prague and got told the morning of the game that I would be playing in the evening. So, you know, special memories. I mean, along the way, uh, in that first period, we, we were very, very lucky that we weren't at the top 10 which is the old you know first division the old the, the Premier League as it is now and uh, we beat Chelsea away we beat Arsenal away we beat Spurs away you know we beat all the big clubs um, which you know we're very privileged to be part of obviously in recent times <coughs> excuse me the promotions were, were fantastic when uh, the boss came back when when Tommy was around as well and obviously beating your local rivals 4-0 away is always a good win yeah, no, massively. And, and Tommy, obviously, you mentioned about being in charge of the kitty. Sounds like it's like Nigel was like the, one of the greatest teammates off off the pitch as well. But but on the pitch, playing with him, having him in your side, how how important of a player was he for you in your starting eleven? I think because he was held in such high regard with the club, but also within the dressing room. You know, we trusted him, respected him. Probably not always the oldest player in there either. It was just the fact that you know he'd been in and around the club. So if there was anything that that needed to be to be known, then you, you go to Gibbo. He's your your prime suspect if you if you want a little bit of detail about Watford Football Club. So I think it was it was part of that. And then you knew, well, certainly the, the playoff semi final, you, you could play anywhere under the pitch really, um, and come in and do the job that was required of the gaffer. So. Yeah, obviously difficult to talk talk about him when he's here. It's easier when he's not here to to to, to, to applaud him. But yeah, we're yeah, well respected teammate. Yeah, no, massively. Well, let's take a quick look at our, our greatest eleven team as it is uh, right now, because of course we're very blessed to have uh, one of our team in the studio tonight. Of course, uh, with Nigel picked by Tommy Smith just a few weeks ago. Um, so that's where our team is at the moment. As we've mentioned already, Nigel's going to be adding his player to that this evening. Uh, and of course, we want you to get your questions in as well for Tommy and for Nigel. You know how to do that by now. If you're watching on YouTube or if you're on social media at Watford FC, use the hashtag of Inside the Hive. And we'd love your memories of the late, great Graham Taylor as well tonight, because we're going to be talking about the boss a little bit later on on the show as well. So uh, do get involved. Questions for Tommy and Nigel and also your memories of Graham Taylor. OK, let's uh, have a little reflection on this week, Tommy D. Go, move forward because obviously disappointment you still can't get to Burnley and <laughs> as much as you're trying this season and have tried over the years you still can't get there for a game obviously frustrating this week because we talked so much last week about how this was going to be a massive week you know get a good result against Newcastle get a result against Burnley we go into tomorrow with with a really strong positive mindset yeah I think obviously the results at Newcastle and then the postponement of the game on Tuesday makes tomorrow night's game even more vital that we get um, a win out of the game. So, yeah, perhaps a, a disappointing performance at, at Newcastle. Everything that we talked about in the opening 20 minutes, you know, be steady, hold your shape, it didn't really come. We got a lucky there with uh, when Jeremy Ngakia um, just cleared it onto his crossbar. And you think sometimes when, when things like that happen, you think that, well, this is going to go well for us. But we, we started the game OK perhaps not at the tempo that we, we would have liked. Um, and then as the game went on, obviously indiv another individual error and then Sam Maximum scores. That was the first time you heard the noise that we expected from the very first whistle. Um, and then almost maybe five minutes before that, they were starting to turn a little bit, the St. James's Park crowd. So to get back into the game, you know, Joe Pedro had a really quiet game, but then when he scores the the, the equaliser late on from a great cross from, from Kiko Femenia who came onto the pitch five minutes earlier perhaps. You think you get back into the game and perhaps you, people were grateful of a point but 
for me then that's when you really go at them in that final 10 minutes because they were shaky mm -hmm. so I think disappointment all around just to get a point but because of the way the, the game panned out grateful we never lost it mm. um, Nigel I know you've seen a few games this season yes. obviously we welcomed you to the West Ham game just a, a few weeks back um, what's your assessment been of, of the games you've seen of Watford so far I was at the first game of the season against Villa and they played very well and got a very good result the, the recent games I've seen um, they always looked a threat going forward, but obviously it's defensively that they've struggled. And I think probably people have spoken about that before. But <clears throat> like Tommy says, I think going to Newcastle, that the pressure was massively on Newcastle to get a result because they would have probably looked at that fixture and think, yeah, that's that's one we, we, we should be winning if we want to get out of the position we're in. But, you know, it's the same tomorrow night against Norwich. And I'll be coming to the game. You know, I expect Watford to be on the front foot. Really important, as Tommy says, start well. Um, good intensity, good tempo. And I think, obviously... I didn't see the game, but Tommy spoke about the three new players that, that did well. Um, that's really important that they're coming in and hitting the ground running. It's not easy uh, to come into the Premier League, um, but uh, it sounds as if they did OK. But you know, it's really important tomorrow that we start well and uh, on the front foot and hopefully put them under pressure. Tommy, you mentioned last week kind of getting points out of these games was really important for, for table positioning. Obviously, that game on Tuesday got taken away, that opportunity to get some points on the board. Um, how important is three points tomorrow? It's massive now because we've lost the opportunity to, to take three from Burnley. We only took one against uh, uh, Newcastle. So while it's the most important thing is we don't lose against these, these teams in and around us at the bottom, but a home game against Norwich City, we should be winning in the Premier League. We, we talked last week about how it could set up. It could, we could have been going for ninth, the ninth point of the week. It hasn't panned out that way, but we'll certainly like to see go into the weekend's fixtures with four points from from the last two games it has to be a win tomorrow night obviously it's been very difficult circumstances for teams up up and down the Premier League um, Nigel what's it was it been like the last two years obviously from a coaching perspective and sometimes there's games on sometimes there are games off because a lot of effort goes in behind the scenes that we all don't see and then to have a game called off last minute must be incredibly challenging yeah it is and obviously it's good that the crowd are back obviously when we when I was at Tottenham in the in the last season there was no crowd so you never got that experience but as you say you you have to prepare that the game is going to be on and you have to be ready um, for whatever comes your way but it can be difficult because it disrupts the week um, sometimes uh, you know you're you're preparing and then someone goes down with a you know covid it, it's not easy but you know everyone's professional you have to be organized you have to be ready and uh, you have to have that mindset you, you, you're going to be playing and obviously Looking at the Premier League table right now, mm. there's there's lots of sides with, with lots of games in hand. Yes. You know, we look at Burnley that are in around us in the league table at the moment. I think they've got five games to make up. Um, do, do you see that as an advantage or, or a disadvantage for, 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 for us? You know, The fact mm. that they've got to squeeze a lot of games yeah. into a tight period and it's going to be a big ask for the players. It is, and um, it, it's not easy to win a Premier League game. So even though they've got five games in hand, you have to win them. That's the only way you can benefit from having those games in hand. And it won't be easy. And as you say, as they go along, they'll be... You know, playing Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, and and injuries and and other situations might not might not help them. So, as Tommy said, tomorrow night's really really important. You know, we, we're expecting the the team to come out firing. Um, three points is 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 very very important to us. And and I spoke to Tommy earlier. It's, it's important you don't lose the team below you at any stage of the season. You must beat those teams below you. Do you think? Sense. Do you think playing Friday night as opposed to Saturday might help us? Yes, night? definitely. Behind, underneath the lights here with the supporters as well, they're going to be, you know, very important. But I agree, if they get those three points on the board, that makes a statement to the rest of the teams around around Watford. So, you know, we can't emphasise how important it is tomorrow. Yeah, massively. And we'll look forward to that game a little bit later on in the show as well. So you need your support massively uh, tomorrow evening. Okay, time now to hear from a man who scored that all-important equaliser last weekend at Newcastle. Uh, we're going to hear from João Pedro now, who's been reflecting on his time so far here at Watford. Como é trabalhar com com Claudio? É, eu sempre busco aproveitar o máximo porque treinadores como ele que tem bastante experiência, sabe no que pode nos ajudar. Então ele sempre vem conversando comigo para que eu possa evoluir sempre mais e ajudar o Watford no que for preciso. O que ele espera de você? Você fala com o Claudio muito? Sim, ele sempre... Como eles vêm falando comigo, ele sempre espera que eu... Dê um... Que eu faça uma jogada diferente que... Do que eu venho fazendo nos jogos, que eu venho demonstrando que... Nosso, entre aspas, jeito brasileiro de ser, de fazer um... 
algo diferente, de dar um passe, de fazer o gol, de um drible. Ele sempre vem conversando comigo para eu fazer isso mais vezes nos jogos. Agora vamos falar mais sobre você. Dois anos aqui. Já se está habituando à Inglaterra? Já se sente casa aqui? Então, esses dois anos para mim aqui na Inglaterra foram fundamentais. Eu pude aprender um pouco mais o inglês, uma nova cultura, é, um novo país, né? Então, eu gosto daqui, eu me sinto confortável aqui e espero continuar aqui muitos e muitos anos. Como foi marcar contra o Manchester United uh, o seu primeiro gol na Premier League? Um momento inesquecível? É, particularmente foi um momento inesquecível porque eu tive uma perda é, familiar e meu padrasto sempre... Sempre sonhava com esse jogo contra o Manchester United, então acho que foi um momento especial não só para mim, mas para toda a minha família, porque marcar naquela noite foi uma, uma data marcante que sempre vai estar na minha memória. There we go, João Pedro, of course, with a, a massive goal last weekend against Newcastle. Um, Tommy, what's your assessment of, of his performances so far this year? He's kind of starting to settle in, he said there, and kind of finding home now within England. But how are you assessing his performances on the pitch? Certainly his goal last weekend was very much appreciated. Um, I think it probably plaudits to the manager for leaving him on the pitch because him and Dennis were well below par last week, but he chose to take Dennis off, leave João Pedro on and then he gets his goal, um, which gets us the point. I think it, he finds it difficult within this system. When they've tweaked it a little bit and played a 4-2-3-1, João Pedro, I think you get the best out of him as a 10, playing behind, directly behind. Josh King, um, but he's going to have to develop that that way. The manager likes this system. He's going to have to develop his game and do the things that the manager wants. Because essentially, you know, we've played for the best. If you don't do what he wants, you don't play. Mm. So he's going to have to develop his game in this system. Mm. Nigel, he says that the, the, the manager kind of expects him to do something out of the ordinary. Um, when you're in a position in the league where we are at the moment, you need those players to step up and, and create that extraordinary. You do, and you want him to create a goal out of nothing. Um, I think he's got the talent to do it. Uh, I haven't seen much of him, but I've liked what I've seen. Um, you know, he can beat people. He can obviously finish the goal last week, hopefully give him a bit of confidence. But yeah, you're, you're expecting those players to, to either create or, or score a goal when, it, when, when you need them most. Yeah, no, massively. And, and Tommy, obviously, moving forward this season, you mentioned kind of maybe he sorts that number 10 role, but I guess that as a player, sometimes you know, you've played in different positions across the pitch. You, you've got to embrace that. No, you have to. And it, it, essentially, you're not a footballer if you're not playing. So whatever you have to do to, to get in the team, that's the way you have to, to, to change your outlook. Um, an extremely talented footballer. He surprised me last season because he played that nine role that I didn't think he could play and he did it ever so well in the championship. So maybe just that, this little tweaks and, uh, and adaptations of, of what the manager wants, certainly they're, they're smaller changes than the one from last season as playing as a nine when, when Troy was injured. So he can do it because he's a good footballer and he's got a good football brain. Um, obviously, the, the more his English improves, the easier that is as well with working within the team unit and when you're on the training ground. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing more from João Pedro. Mm. Um, Nigel, obviously from a, from a coaching perspective, when, when you stepped into that first team role with Tottenham last year, mm. you know, yourself and Ryan and, and the management team, they would have had an idea of how you wanted to play. How, how quick does that change take to happen with the players' understanding of what you want them to do that may be different to what they've been used to all season? Yeah, I think uh, with Joel Pedro, the, uh, the manager obviously backs him and, and he's picking him, selecting to, to do that role. Maybe it's not quite you know, the role he wants to play, but uh, he's obviously good enough to do that. You know, as you say there, when, when you take over a team near the end of the season, it's very hard to implement too many changes. You'll just have to tweak it a little bit. But uh, sort of the, the level of player, they're, they're intelligent players and they're international players. So you, you, you can talk to them and, you know, unfortunately, you wouldn't get that much time on the pitch to, to work on it but because you had uh, a lot of games. But... Uh, the quality of player, the intelligence of player, you, you can just tweak things and, and they pick it up very quickly. Okay. Well, talking of coaching, a friend of the show, Gifton Noel Williams, has taken on a new role at the moment with the women's team, uh, which we're very excited to see him uh, do incredibly well. We're going to talk a bit more about that role for Gifton in a moment, but here is his thoughts on that new position. 
had a few weeks in interim charge now. What have been your initial impressions regarding the squad? Squad's good. Squad's very good. Um, I was quite fortunate, uh, I must admit, that I was in before Christmas um, volunteering some of my time and helping out uh, the old manager. So for that reason, I got to know some of the girls anyway and get to know their characters and how they play. And, and you know what, we, subconsciously, I didn't think I was doing it, but subconsciously, there was things in my mind thinking, well, this player could play like that, that player could play like that, because I didn't really realise it, but as soon as I, I got the opportunity, I had a plan straight away, so I must have been thinking about it somewhere in my mind. Finally, if there's one thing you want to see in your time in interim charge, what would it be? Wins. <laughs> I want to win games. Um, I want to win games. I'm, I'm, I'm a winner. I've, I've always, always been a winner. I want to win games, and I want to win games in a certain way. Um, I think that the players we've got in the squad got some really exciting players, really, really exciting players. And I think it's a shame that you've got so many exciting players and, and not play exciting football. So I'm hoping that we'll play some exciting football, um, win some games. Um, if I'm here for four, five, six, whatever, whatever games it is, um, I'd want my, the, the ratio of points per game to be good. I'd want to leave the squad, the players in the squad in a better place than how I found them. The main thing for me has been to put a smile on the players' faces again. And that may seem sim sim silly. Everyone wants to p talk about tactics and, and your philosophy, all those things. And the only thing I was really interested for the first week or so was just putting a smile back on the pl players' places and trying to remind them of why did you play football in the first place? I know why I play football. I know why I love still in football. I know why I love the game so much. But I want them to remember why they loved it so much. And I think we managed to do that between the coaching staff, the backroom staff, the general managers being excellent. Between us all, I think we've managed to get some smiles back on the faces. And for me, if I can do that and they can finish the season with smiles on their faces and, and safe, we have to be safe. <clears throat> um, if we're safe and they've got smiles on their faces, then I can say, well, my time here has been, has been good. Thank you very much and good luck for Sunday. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, they're gifting then. Interim head coach of the women's team at the moment, um, Tommy, when he's been in the studio so far this season, incredibly passionate about his coaching and great to see him relishing that role. feel a bit gutted for him, obviously losing last minute in, in his first game with, as interim coach, but you know, I think bright future for him there. Yeah, don't be, don't be fooled by the smile on his face as well. He wants to win. Um, that's part of being a, a professional um, that he's been. Um, but he will put a smile on their face. We, we know Gifting that. I woke him up in his car a couple of weeks ago because he'd been coaching all day and he was coming on the show and I just <laughs> tapped on the window and even as he woke up he smiled at me and then went back to sleep for half an hour. Uh, <laughs> but he loves coaching, he really does love coaching. So it's a great opportunity and a huge opportunity for, for the ladies in the group to learn from him. He knows what, he, what he's doing, he's been through a, a really long career, different countries. They should be like a, a sponge and, and listen to what he's got to say. Yeah, Nigel, a great character, isn't he, Gifted? And yeah. You can just see he's really relishing that opportunity to coach, which is obviously something that you relish post your football career as well. Yeah, I mean, he's a very infectious person, isn't he? Very positive and uh, I'm sure he'll do well. And as you say, with the experience that he's got and uh, his passion for the game, I'm sure you know he'll do a very, very good job. And uh, it was unlucky to lose on uh, the weekend, I heard. So you know, we wish him well and uh, we really hope he goes, uh, you know, gets some good results for the, for the ladies. Yeah, never no, certainly do. We're keeping an eye on that, of course, as we go through the remainder of the season. Uh, of course, if you want to go and see the women in action, uh, Sunday 23rd of January, 3 o'clock kickoff at King's Langley. They are taking on Blackburn Rovers. You can get your tickets now at tickets.watfordfc.com. OK, time now for another 60-second challenge, and we're going to stay with the women's team for this one because it is Georgie Ferguson who's taking it on this week. I'm Georgie Ferguson, and this is my 60-second challenge. If you could change position, where would you play? Striker. Home games or away games? Home. Penalty shootout in the final, would you go first or last? Last. Best dish you can cook? Mac and cheese. Most famous person on your phone? Helen Ward. Coach or train to away games? Coach. Last minute winner or hat trick? Last minute winner. Team you supported as a kid? West Ham. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Best stadium apart from Vicarage Road? Uh, London Stadium. VAR, love it or hate it? Love it. Worst teammate to share a room with? Mia. Favourite sport other than football? Netball. Favourite movie? Uh, Mamma Mia. Favourite food? Chicken. Football manager or FIFA? FIFA. First football boots? Uh, Tiempos. 
Ronaldo or Messi? Messi. Morning person or night owl? Night. PlayStation or Xbox? Xbox. Favourite TV series? Grey's Anatomy. If you could play any instrument, what would it be? Guitar. Text message or phone call? Text. Netflix or Prime? Netflix. Fancy restaurant or takeaway? Fancy restaurant. Dream dinner guest? Mm, Helen Ward. <laughs> Say that felt pretty rapid. 26. Helen Ward. <laughs> there we go. Joint top of the leader table. Uh, Tommy, I feel like we need to give you another go later in the season, to be fair. I'm actually Fourth disappointed. Place. I've lost my bronze medal. <laughs> <laughs> the not that board. I'm competitive at no. all. No, well. not at all. Not at all. Well, talking of uh, being competitive, it's time for Tommy's favourite part of the show, Ask Tommy. If you're a regular viewer of the show, you'll know basically I'm going to ask our guests some questions about themselves uh, and each other. Tommy's questions are notoriously difficult, uh, where our guests' questions will be incredibly Easy. Uh, aim of the game is basically just to make Tommy lose the game. Uh, so uh, we had a that's, break that's last week. That's not even a joke. <laughs> that's genuinely that true. Is how it is. Uh, so Tommy, your four questions. We've now made the fifth question. A question we'll come to at the end. Both of you get to participate in. Uh, so five mm. questions for Tommy. We always start with a golf question. And your first question is this: Who won the match, Tiger Woods versus Phil Mickelson in 2018? Very famous golf match. They went head to head. Tiger. Incorrect, it was Phil Mickelson. He was my second choice. <laughs> <laughs> You've never got a golf question wrong either, first time. I think it's because you never told me what match it was. Well, they played, it was the famous game, mm. Nigel knows. It's a very famous game where they went head-to-head -head on TV in Vegas, yeah. You're trying to make it sound like you know what you're talking about <laughs> I do, golf. I like golf, I play golf. Just because you won't play with me because I've got a better handicap than you. <laughs> Meaning it's higher, which means I get more much shots. Much higher, I've yeah. Got I, more don't, shots. I don't play with bandits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question two. Uh, true or false, Nigel, as a youth player, played as a striker before moving to right back? True. True. Correct, well done. Point on the board. Question number three. If you were listening, you'll know the answer to this one. Uh, Nigel made his debut in which competition? UEFA Cup, FA Cup or First Division? UEFA Cup. Correct. Sparta Prague. Two points on the board. Well done. Uh, your Maybe. final question for now is, in May 2006, you were inducted into the Watford Hall of Fame. But were you the fourth, the third or the fifth <laughs> player to be inducted? He knows this. I was number four. <laughs> Confident? 100%. Correct. You were the fourth. Uh, three points. Thank Just you. Just dropped the golf question today. Yeah, I'll take that. Not a bad I start. thought it was a leading question. I'm not happy with it, but <laughs> <laughs> crack on. Okay, three points. Uh, but now it's time for the important questions because uh, they're the ones that you've sent in so far. Uh, so thank you very much to everyone who's taken the time so far to do that. Still plenty of time if you want to get your question in on social media or in the comments box below wherever you're watching tonight's show. Uh, so first question comes from Charlotte Gibson. She says, please can we ask Sir Nigel what his best memory playing in a Watford shirt was? Um... Well, I think we spoke about it, but my debut, definitely my debut against uh, Sparta Prague, um, just turned pro and given the opportunity to play, that was probably uh, you know, a, a great memory for me. And at the end, I think uh, Tommy mentioned it earlier on the show, the, the semi-final away from Birmingham, uh, when we played Birmingham away was you know, one of the best atmospheres I ever played in. Um, out of position, not played for a while, but uh, you know, I like to think that I've come in and did a good job for the team and got us to Wembley. Mm. That debut, of course, was here, wasn't it? Because you, you played it in was, both legs, but the I debut did. was here. That's right, yeah. It was, uh, the second leg was in December, so I played November uh, 23rd, um, three days after my birthday, but here at Vickers Road, under lights, you know, a, a real special moment. Mm. Yeah, it must have been. Uh, Keith would like to know, <laughs> what was it like playing alongside Tommy during his spell as a defender? Well, I, I've got to say, uh, um, we'll talk about defenders later on, but... Uh, you know, for someone who's played with their back to goal for most of their, their career, it's, it, it's so difficult to come and then be, you know, the, the players in front. I think it's easier to play with, uh, you know, you, the ball in front of you. Uh, it's harder to play with your back to goal. So he, he did a really good job and, and you have to have a lot of football intelligence to play that. Um, and it, it, he, he does, probably doesn't get the credit he deserves to actually go into that position. And again, it was a, a genius move from the, from the boss, you know, to, to put Tommy in that position. And, uh, you know, all credit to him. Would he make your all-time greatest 11? We'll have to wait and see. Good answer, I like that. If uh, we had to play a back three. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't play in a back four, that's why the gaffer <laughs> shipped me back up front. <laughs> oh, amazing. And, and Tommy, your memories of, of playing alongside Nigel, let's throw it back to you. 
Yeah, I, I remember when the gaffer came back into the club, mm. I, I was here and I think it was you and Ports left from yes. the first time right. around. And obviously I'd experienced the gaffer to a lesser extent at Aston Villa, but it, between Gibbo and Ports, they made sure that everybody knew what to expect when he was coming in the door. He was very, very different um, to any other managers. And, and obviously, we both mentioned it, I, I remember that, that playoff semi-final, you know, with that perform level of performance after coming in out of the cold, so to speak. Um, yeah, just, we, we had a great time. Yeah, amazing. Um, next question comes from Sarah. Um, you were a one club man, but how close did you ever come to signing for another club? Um, only a couple of times. Um, I think there, there was talk of, of Arsenal wanting me when um, probably in the mid to late 80s. Um, but I didn't know about that till probably later on. The club said they turned it down and they weren't interested. Um, there was a couple of times when we, we had some bad seasons and we were struggling where, you know, was I, you know, was I needing to go elsewhere to further my career? But it just never happened, and you know I don't regret it. But probably a couple of times during that, but not 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 many times. Um, Alex says, have you ever con considered management, um, or is it just the coaching and kind of that assistant role that really attracts you? Yeah, I've been asked that uh, a few times. I mean, I've had the opportunity to manage a few times, but I, I didn't think when I got offered those opportunities I was ready. Um, I always felt I needed a bit more experience. Um, and then I really got into the coaching and really enjoyed that. So I, I see myself more as an assistant or a coach. Uh, I would never say never, but uh, I'm quite happy being that, that assistant. Nice. Uh, next, uh, this one comes from your Orns TV. Uh, it says, uh, Sir Nigel, please can you tell your Elton John joining in a five-a-side in China story? It's a classic. Um, yeah, um, we were very lucky at the end of the season. Though, we went to China and um, Sir Elton came along and... Um, we were in hotels and that, that was the only place that he got recognised. So it was just tourists, obviously in China, they, they didn't really know who he was, but um, we were on a tour there and Billy Howes, uh, who was the physio and in charge at the time, because the boss had left to, to go to Aston Villa, he said that uh, Elton wanted to join in a five-a-side. So, um, listen lads, take it easy on him, you know, just let him have the ball, let him enjoy it. You know, no, don't tackle him, leave him alone. And then within five seconds of him receiving the ball, Tim Sherwood had a 50-50 with him and he ended up on the floor. And it was like a tumbleweed moment and uh, everyone's looking at each other. But Elton got up and he absolutely loved it and really enjoyed it. So we were all panicking that he would be injured and he wouldn't be able to go and do his tours or whatever. But uh, yeah, so that was a, an interesting time, but a really good, really good trip. Amazing. Um, final comment at the moment comes from uh, a good friend of yours, Tony Coton. TC, yeah. Watching the show right now. <laughs> TC, evening. And he says, uh, two top men on the show this evening, Sir Nige and number four, Tommy. Also, Big Ben is the man. Uh, thanks for watching, Tony. Hopefully you're enjoying the show. I'll tell you the, t the story behind the yeah. number four. Go on, tell us. Is, well, we're all good mates. When TC rings me, he's in there as number two with a picture of the Catherine Tate nan that comes <laughs> up. When I ring him on his phone, it comes up number four and a picture of the Thunderbirds character. <laughs> so that's why TC that's why Tommy knew he was that's number why. four in the uh... that's why I know I'm four and you're two yes you're in there before me <laughs> <laughs> alright pal I don't know mine <laughs> what's nice uh, I actually don't know that I know why yeah. Robbo's number 17 I know that <laughs> <laughs> you never know I'm, we I'm, might... I'm just pleased I'm in it <laughs> amazing um, right thank you very much for all your questions so far keep those coming in and of course your memories of, of the late great Graham Taylor as well keep those coming in for us on the show today. Okay, time now then to move on to our Watford Greatest Eleven. Uh, we are picking another centre-back today. Nigel has the pleasure of that. This is the team we have so far. Of course, when you pick a player for our Greatest Eleven, your name is also attached to it as well. So a lot of responsibility falls on your shoulder. Of course, you can pick a player you've played with before, someone that's played for the club that you, that you watched, uh, or like Tommy, you can pick your best friend. Uh, so <laughs> uh, we are picking a centre to back. Um, let's talk about the position first of all. Um, for, for you, Nigel, what are you looking for in a, in a centre back? Um, first and foremost, you know, they've, they've got to be strong and aggressive. They can win the headers, um, get blocks in, uh, organise their defence and obviously, you know, start the attacks. But, um, you know, it was a, quite a difficult choice for me, to be honest. Obviously, I've played with a lot of players and coached a lot of them, but uh, 
Um, you know, I looked, I looked at them all, and uh, obviously I'll give you a choice in a minute. But uh, no, it's a very important position for the team as well. You know, it's it's the uh, backbone of the team, and uh, you know, more often than not, they are leaders as well. They're a good voice. They often become the captains. Uh, very important position. Mm. And tell me, how important is is that partnership of of whether you play three in there or you play a two in there? How mm. how important is that partnership that you know each other well? Yeah, I think it's really important. You have to be. It's not just communication. It's knowing what the other's going to do at any given time. It's very, very similar to the to the relationship that a pair of strikers has, because when the ball's in the air, if one's going for it, the other one's got to drop and cover, or he's got to know what, where his partner is on the pitch. It's slightly different when I played in a, in a three. I had uh, Robert Page and, and Keith Millen, who were out and out defenders. It gave me a little bit more freedom. I probably couldn't have played that role without the to the two of those. Um, we see Pagey, you know, one of the youngest ever captains at, at Watford, lifting a trophy on one, one of, certainly one of the best days, if not the best day in my career. Um, so, yeah, I think those those combinations are the key to it. And, and like Gibbo says, the, the spine of the team is vitally important. And to have that, that triangle between the goalkeeper and the two centre-backs makes everybody else feel safe if you get that right. Mm. How difficult it is in the modern game to, to find a player that, that's solid like that? Obviously, from your perspective, from perspective from recruitment and yours from coaching, how difficult is it to find that perfect player these days? It's very difficult because everyone wants a ball playing centre half, but they mustn't forget the most important thing is defending. Um, so it, it's not easy to coach both, and not easy to be be that good to be able to do both. But you know that's what you're looking for in a, in a centre back that he can defend, but also he can he can start the, the attacks off and bring the ball out and and, and and pass into midfield, have a range of of passes. But you know he's still got to defend the box, which is the most important thing. Defend the crosses, the ball the ball in behind. As Tommy said, work as a partnership. You know, read off each other, cover off each other. Obviously, that communication with the goalkeeper as well. But you know, it's a it's a very important position, and it, it it's really hard. I think it's an experienced position as well. You know, you have to learn your trade. Um, you don't see many young centre backs playing. You know, they have to earn that um, experience. Uh, you know, playing games and 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 trial and error. A lot of it. You know, working working hard alongside a. You know, if you have an experienced one, it, it's very useful. Mm. And from a recruit, recruitment perspective, Tommy, everyone wants one. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and people talk about. I think more now. Um, that, than perhaps certainly in recent years, you want somebody that can play. But from a recu recruitment point of view, it's quite often people will, will go and watch a player and say, he can't do that, he can't do that. I, I think it's much easier to say, he can do that, he can do that, and he can do that. I'll give, then sign him, give him to Nigel Gibbs, and as a coach, he can then make him do that within a, a set amount of, uh, of time. The smarter the player is, the quicker that happens from a coach's point of view. So I, I, I get that, and I, and I like that side of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Nigel, I've got your your contenders in front yes. of me here. Talk, talk us through your shortlist and, and those players that came into your mind for this position. Um, there was David Holdsworth. I mean, when I first got into the team, I had Steve Terry, Steve Sims, Ian Bolton. Uh, they were really helpful to me. Um, but David Holdsworth actually played nearly over 300 games for, for, for Watford. Very strong, aggressive defender. And then Keith Millen. Um, who, who played alongside Tommy at the back and was again nearly 200 games for the club. Very good at reading the game. Uh, again, aggressive, winning the ball first, intercepting. Um, you know, and then obviously Robert Page. Um, obviously at the latter stage of my career, he became a captain, but a real strong leader, good organizer. Um, you know, used his body well. Was first to the ball in the box, first to the ball. Um, so, you know, all those came into, into my thoughts and then other players that I've coached. But uh, um, there is one player that stood out for me, really, and helped me along the way uh, when I was a young player. OK, so let's put us out of our misery. OK. Uh, who would you like to put into the side? Uh, John McClelland. Um, he was uh, an Irish international. He went to two World Cups, um, player of the year twice. Um, he would actually fit into the modern game really, really well. Um, he was one of the ones who could read the ball, uh, read the play um, and step in, intercept, pass into midfield. He was, he was that type of player back in, back in uh, my early days in the 80s. He was also good in the air, um, a very good organiser, his captain. And talk about reading danger and, and I learned a lot from him, you know, where, where to, uh, to be at the right time, uh, stepping in, intercepting. So a lot of the time it wasn't a tackle, it was the reading of the game, stepping up offside, 
working with another uh, centre half, and, and that's the reason why I put him in. He was a he was a top top player, and he actually went on to to win the first division, which is Premier League, with Leeds United as well. But uh, an outstanding player. Yeah, completely agree. I, I said last week he'd be my first choice, um, so I, I definitely agree. Robert Page and Keith Millen, two old roommates of mine, both make a terrible cup of tea, um, <laughs> but very very close to to John. But I completely agree with Nigel's choice. I see. Well, the choice has been made. Mm -hmm. We're going to put it into our lineup here. There we go. John McLennan has been picked uh, by Nigel Gibbs. That completes our back four. And your assessment of that defensive line, then, from from a coach's perspective, would you like to work with that back four? I'll be pleased with that back four, and I'll be expecting many clean sheets, especially <laughs> with uh, the goalkeeper as well. Yeah, massively. And, and just a word on yourself being picked in there as well. You know, to, obviously Tommy Smith picked you to, mm. to put in, put into that side, and that was another strong list of contenders as well. So. For you, it must be it must be feel incredibly special to to be picked from from a fellow teammate to, to feature. Yeah, I think you always you know you you, you when that when your teammate uh, picks you as player of the year or picks you in teams like this, you know obviously it's very special. I, I played a lot of games. I was captain of the of the club, but. You know, you want that from from fellow teammates to say, look, oh, he was a decent player, uh, very reliable, trustworthy, can do the job, and that, that makes you feel special. And, and and when you when you finish your career, and then you get these uh, evenings or people saying that you know you're in the the greatest eleven, obviously it, it's a great moment. But uh, I mean, there's been many many good fullbacks, and um, I think consistency was probably one of my strengths and, and reliability. But um, obviously pleased to be in that eleven. Tommy, you didn't make it into the defensive lineup. Still hope though. <laughs> yeah, obviously. And there's still hope. Yeah, you've scored a lot of goals in your career and a very well respected Watford player. So there is still an opportunity for you, maybe. Well, Gibbo was in there twice, once as a as yes. a picker and then selected. So mm. it'll be interesting yeah. to see if there's any others like what that. What we'll do is when we do the attackers, we'll get Robbo in and see if he repays the favour. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Let's look forward now then uh, to the game tomorrow night under the lights here at Vicarage Road. Uh, we've alluded to it already, but Tommy, a massive game against Norwich City tomorrow night. Um, let's look at Norwich's form under Dean Smith. Of course, they've had a change of manager this season as well. So far, he's played 10, eight points on the board. Um, a big victory for them against Everton last weekend. That's going to buoy their confidence coming here. Yeah, it will, but you know, we know what the issues are with, with, with Everton of late. Um, obviously, we managed to beat them at Goodison. So, yeah, they'll be buoyed by that because the best place um, for a footballer to be is a winning dressing room. And to get that feeling after such a long time, that will buoy the, the, the atmosphere in that dressing room for Norwich. And it's one that we need to find quickly. Ideally, about 24 hours time, we start that game. That's, the, that's what we need to do. We need to get back into that winning feeling. Um, and we've got to work really, really hard to do that because, you know, Dean will have them certainly wound up for the game and they've tr they'll have travelled across um, knowing that they have to win this game if they've got any chance of, of staying up. So really it's, it's all or nothing for Norwich. Yeah. Perhaps not exactly the same for us, although our mindset from our era would be exactly the same. Mm. Nigel, what do you make of, of Norwich? Because, of course, over the last few seasons, they've become known as this yo-yo side that, that come up. They don't really invest much into their side. Um, but it still doesn't mean they're easy to beat. No, it doesn't. And, and coming off the victory from last week will give them confidence. But uh, you know, just looking at their form there, and, and they obviously don't score many goals. So it's really important that we um, defend well, we're organised, and, and they've conceded a lot of goals. And so it's important that we put them under pressure. You know, they're not going to change. Their mentality might have changed a little bit from from the win last week, but you know, if you put them under pressure, um, you know, they concede goals. Mm, they must be. Um, Tommy, what do we need to do tomorrow night? Off the back of that Newcastle game, what do we need to make sure we do tomorrow evening to, to come away with those three points? I think, and I, I do think, playing a, a, a night game on, in front of the, the the home supporters under the lights. I think we start the game better, take the game to them, play with a tempo that they can't cope with. Our strength is going forward. Use that strength. Don't be embarrassed by it. Whatever it takes, get the ball forward and get the ball in the in the back of their net. Like Gibbo said, they, they do concede goals. They don't have that luxury of Pookie last season scoring week in, week out. Pookie scored a couple of goals. Ida's come into the team who's a good young prospect but they don't have that same attacking threat that we have this season. And I think we have to utilise that, that more. Stay strong and organised at the back. Um, certainly with Ben Foster coming back in at Newcastle, that's, that was a, a definite plus. 
Um, and the new three new signings at Newcastle were very, very good, impressive on their, their Premier League debuts. So hopefully something of the same um, tomorrow night. But organised, concentrated at the back and go and attack this Norwich team. Playing first in a Premier League weekend as well. Friday night, we've mentioned, of course, under the lights is always very special here at Vicarage Road. But does that give you a bit of an edge, a bit of an advantage that you're playing before everyone else? Yes, if you win, definitely. Um, and that's sort of going to be told to the players, I'm sure, tomorrow. Just on the defending side, it's, it's not just the, the back players, it's, it's the whole team. You know, you've got to defend from the front. So it's important that the front players and the midfield are solid as well. They're organised, you know, the concentration. But I think it would be very important if we get that result tomorrow night, you know, that, that Saturday, uh, looking at the other fixtures, will be very, very special if we can get the three points. That yeah, certainly will. Well, let's uh, get the thoughts of uh, Claudio Ranieri. He spoke to the press a little bit earlier on today. How big is this game tomorrow for Watford? Oh, it's, it's a very big. It was a big against Newcastle, another crash between two teams who want to stay in Premier League. And uh, we need uh, the support of uh, our crowd. We need uh, the passion. We need uh, the, the everything. And uh, I'm sure we'll do a very good match tomorrow. Do you expect Norwich to come into this game with extra self-belief given their positive result last week? Of course, of course. They won against Everton and now they are full of uh, uh, um, confidence and uh, but also we are full of confidence after we drew the match in the last minute in Newcastle. It's been a long time since your team won a game, eight games now, but did that equaliser against Newcastle feel like a win around the squad? Yes, uh, but only also the, all the, 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 the performance against Newcastle, not just that we score a goal at the end, no, because we create a, a very good chances. The second half, they score a goal, but never they shoot a goal. And uh, for us, it's, it's very important now get a point against uh, Norwich. I know it will be a tough match, but we are ready. Is that going to be the key to staying in this division, getting results against the teams around you? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, and of course, the, the Premier League doesn't uh, stop after Norwich. We have to continue to fight, to, to win, to draw, to lose. For, I hope uh, very, very few lose <laughs> losing match, but that's it, that's it. Uh, we are uh, very, very full of energy now. There we go, the thoughts of Claudio Ranieri there. The side full of energy uh, ahead of tomorrow night's game. Of course, Tommy, 3-1 victory in the reverse leg at, at their place earlier on in this season. Um, you watched that one and more of the same tomorrow night would be more than welcome. Yeah, absolutely. I did the comms here at Vicarage Road before we were allowed to travel. But obviously, Dennis getting his goal. We need Dennis back to that form from the beginning of the season because that was a really good away performance. And you've seen the, 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 the um, fragilities of the, the Norwich defence first hand and then is it uh, Josh King score on the day and Ismail Asar so it was it was a good away performance we need that performance at home this time yeah no, massively and there'll be lessons obviously take from that game and obviously Nigel from a coach's perspective when, you, when you're looking at that game they're going to be watching that video back as well trying not to make those same mistakes but if there's a, a kind of a hole or somewhere to, to exploit that's what we need to do from looking back at that game yeah definitely I mean you see there the, the, the goals came from crosses and balls in behind them so it's really important that we do that I mean Norwich uh, they like to play an open game I know Dean's probably got try to get them a little bit uh, you know, more compact but th certainly there'll be spaces and down the side especially with the front players we've got the pace and the crosses they, they didn't deal with those crosses very well at all no, they didn't. Well, a massively important game tomorrow night. Uh, now, of course, it's an incredibly special day tomorrow as well because in 2020 and 2021, we were precluded from celebrating the legend that was Graham Taylor. Uh, but tomorrow night, we can once again honour the absolute legend that was Graham Taylor. Of course, his stats here for Watford are absolutely incredible when you look at what he did from this side from 1977 right the way through to 99 with his spells here at the club. An absolute legend, a hero and never forgotten by all of us here at the club. And of course, tomorrow is uh, Graham Taylor scarf day. So please make sure you bring your scarves and make lots of noise as we honor the legend himself. Um, Tommy, Nigel, both of you have incredibly fond memories of, 
of the manager, of the boss. And it's amazing how you both affectionately still call him the boss and, and still call him the manager. And I think that's amazing. And just it's incredible speaking to Tommy all the time about Graham. You can see how much he means to him. But, but Nigel, for you, how special was the boss? Uh, it's hard to put into words, to be honest. I mean, um, yes, still calling the boss, even when I speak to other people, talking about you know him, uh, calling the boss. Uh, but special for my family as well. My father worked for him um, at the club as a, as a coach and a scout, and he was the maintenance manager at the stadium. So you know, our family have got a, you know a lot of affinity with him. I mean, he obviously gave me my debut. Um, he, he, he you know put me in the team regularly, um, coached me from a young age. Uh, and even when I finished playing and went to other clubs, he was always on the end of a phone to help me if I needed any advice. You know, I, w I wouldn't have had the career I had without him, to be honest. Yeah, no, massively. And, and Tommy, it wasn't just what he did for the club, it's what he did for the community as well around Watford. We, we, we were speaking before we come on air, you know, that, that incredibly sad day for his, for his funeral, but just how everyone came out and the whole world of football was there to celebrate him. Yeah, I think I think he'd be very proud that the club is still carrying out all of the initiatives that the club has, has put on for the supporters and anybody who needed any help throughout lockdown and, and either side of it. Um, and that was all to do with the gaffer. You know, it's he was very, very made it very, very clear that the supporters and the community are, are, are more important than the players. Because the the players are transient, the supporters and the community's not. Now, we thoroughly enjoy coming back to the club and working for the club and representing the club as, as ambassadors. Um, but that's the ethos that the gaffer set up many, many years ago. You know, Nigel's seen it over two spells here. I certainly seen it when he came back to the club when I was already here. Um, so, yeah, I think the club are very proud of the gaffer, but the, the gaffer would be very proud of the club too. Mm, no massive Ian. And kind of what he did with Sir Elton was incredibly special as well. You know, you mentioned the times when, you know, Sir Elton was in and around the club as well. Did you get to see much of their relationship together? Yeah, I think they were very good for each other, to be honest. And I think um, Sir Elton's put that in his book, you know, how helpful that uh, the boss was for him in his life. But as, as Tommy said, I think it's, it was, he brought the community to the club and the club to the community. And I, I don't think we've, you know, really appreciated what he did um, you know, he got everyone to, to live in the community. You couldn't live further than 20 miles away. You shopped in the town. You were part of the, 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 the town, um, going to every function there was going. And, and, and it was a real, real community you know, club. And it, it still is. And as Tommy said, he'd be very proud of uh, seeing all, all the, um, the scarves that will be there tomorrow night to, to you know, commemorate to, you know, him uh, building this football club. Because it certainly was. You look there, he came in the Division 4 and he took us into the first division. You know, that's that's something special. Not many people have done that. No, massively. I think it's still incredible when you when you come here on a match day mm. and you see fans of all ages, you know, youngsters that would never have been around when he was, was managing and part of the club that are still having their picture taken by his statue. It shows that kind of legacy he's left. And of course it's important not to forget his his impact on, on football as a whole. When you look at his career as a manager, you know, England in there as well from, from nineteen ninety to ninety three. He had something very special about him as a coach and he's left an indelible mark not just here at Watford, but on clubs up and down the country and for England. Yes, yeah, success uh, pretty much everywhere he went. Uh, Aston Villa, with it, when he left to take the England job, we finished second in the in the old first division, what's now the Premier League. So for a club like that to get promoted and then finish second, which would be a European qualification, you know, it, it's not just Watford where he's had success. Perhaps he, he didn't have the success that he achieved here at other clubs and, you know, I think every club stakes a claim that they were his favourite club, but we know the truth. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's and, and the same with Gibbo will be exactly the same when you see Rita and the girls. It's it's that family ethic, family ethos. He knew every one of the players' wives and children's names. You know, and and I don't think there'd be too many. Even even this current day could could have that sort of knowledge of the players that he works with on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. Very rare for a manager to have two spells at a club and be successful yes. at both. Sometimes you That's see true. a manager go back and it doesn't work out the second time and it kind of tarnishes all that hard work before, but but the boss well and truly made exactly the same impact second time around. He certainly did and I mean that was his biggest strength of putting a team together, um, scouting players, putting a, a system in place. But 
you know, the, the work ethic remained the same. You know, in both spells, it was all about the work ethic, everyone working together, team spirit, togetherness, never give up, going out to win every game. Those things never changed, but obviously the personnel did. And, you know, he, he had that skill, that, that, that knack of just putting the right player in the right place. And um, it was very clear in your role, in whatever position mine was a fullback, I knew my job. I knew my job within the team team uh, framework, and uh, you know he he was he was a genius at that, you know, and, and you can see that by the promotions he gained, not only here but at the other clubs. And I think you know his punditry at the end, he was very very you know you know well respected in that industry as well because of, of his knowledge of the game and seeing of the game, and, and obviously he had the spell as England manager. You know, not many people become England manager. No, they certainly don't. And uh, still incredibly missed by everyone here at the club. So uh, look, tomorrow, another very special evening, obviously with the, with the Graham Taylor scarf day as well. And what a sight that is, you know, all those fans that showing their appreciation for, for the legend, for the man. And just it's just so special, isn't it, when you see that, Tommy, that there's hairs on the back of your neck. Yeah, absolutely. For, for, for everybody not just ex-players like us, for, for all of the supporters in the stadium. Unfortunately, we, we weren't allowed to do it to, to that extent last season. We tried our best with, with Hive Live and did a very good job of it. And I'm, I'm, many uh, Watford supporters have, have told me about that since mentioning that specific day. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big thing. But the gaffer's a big thing to this, to this club. I have to say, when Nigel talks about what he wanted from his players, I did question him when he, he told me at half-time <laughs> in Les's testimonial, playing against Arsenal, he said, I'm gonna, you're playing at centre-half, left of three centre-halves at half-time, playing against Nanelka, <laughs> my debut at centre-half. I did question him. I did question him. Not out loud and not no, to his yeah. face, but you know, we went on to get promotion over the next couple of years with playing at, at left centre half so he, he was a genius with his ideas and, and, and like Gibbo says he, he knew what he wanted from, from everybody and he did it in different ways it wasn't just shouting and screaming you know he's just as likely to come and hug you uh, to help you um, but it was his man management was was yeah. exceptional and years ahead of his game. Yeah massively and obviously lessons that that he taught you that you you take into to your career today without a doubt sometimes I can hear myself saying things oh the boss said that the boss said that you know so you do you can't help but take things off uh, of people that are very successful and as Tommy said he, he had a way of managing players sometimes they needed the arm around them sometimes they needed a you know a rocket or whatever it was but uh, you know and also just looking at the fans there they'd have a connection with the boss as well because they would have you know some of those supporters would have seen the, the rise of the club there was others would have come you know later on um, but you know they would have seen him in the community doing he did the uh, London Marathon he's opened it you know he would have been around and a lot of people would have had a connection with him not just the players and the staff but uh, the whole town. Yeah. I think it's the key to it like, like Gibbo says is pretty much every one of the supporters that I've spoken to during lockdown with all of the initiatives that the, that the club do, everybody has a, a GT story. Some are from football related, some are not. And that's, you know, that's probably shows you the scale of the man. No, massively. So tomorrow night, make sure you bring your scarves, share your stories, tell the young'uns that didn't see him as a coach and a manager, let's keep his me memory well and truly alive. So it's the Graham Taylor scarf match day. Uh, tomorrow night, eight o'clock kickoff. Tommy will be in commentary there with his scarf in hand for that one tomorrow night. Keep in touch with all the social media channels as well, because I'm sure we'll be sharing lots of memories of the boss tomorrow evening. Okay, time now for part two of Ask Tommy. It's time for Ask Nigel. We're gonna ask you for Fingers crossed, incredibly easy questions, which will put you on four points, and then Tommy may have a chance to tie at the end. <laughs> That's how the game works. Don't worry about it, give <laughs> Okay. I Honest. don't fucking ask. Honestly. <laughs> okay. So basically, whatever answer you give, I'm just going to say gonna yes, say, uh, pretty much. Yeah. That's the quiz I like. <laughs> uh, question one. Uh, your first goal came on the 5th of April, 1986, in a 4-1 home victory against who? Newcastle United. Correct. A point. Uh, which manager appointed you as club captain for the 92-93 season? Steve Perriman. Glenn Roder? No, it was Steve Perriman. It was Steve Perriman. Yes, it was, yes. Do Tell us the do story. Don't no, well. be questioning Gibbo. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> That's you, one you, of the rules. You were there. You, can't, you, you can't, were there. You can't can't tell us the story. So, so Glenn Roder is what it says online. No, 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 that was, before, that was Steve Perriman did. Yeah, Steve, Steve Perriman, Perriman yes, made you the club yes, captain. Yes, he did, yeah. 
There we go. Be correcting that on Wikipedia a little bit later on. Correct two points. Well done. Thank you very much. Uh, question three. No, I'm not the only one in the room that's been reprimanded by Gibbo. I'm, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm not going to no, I was I'm captain under Glen Roder as well, but yeah. Steve Perriman was the, uh, the one who gave me the captaincy. I'm not going to argue with Sir Nigel. Good decision. <laughs> uh, question three. You were awarded player of the season in 91-92, but how many other times were you shortlisted for Watford player of the season? Three, four or five? Um, that's a tough question. I'll, that is. I know I was second once, I was third once, so three other times. It was four. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. 85, 86, 88, 89, 90, 91, and 96, 97. Okay. This is for the tie, which will put a lot <sighs> on the last question. <laughs> I, hopefully you're going to get Tough this right. That one. Uh, in 2000, uh, 2021, you were appointed interim head coach at Tottenham Hotspur alongside Ryan Mason and which former Charlton player? That would be Chris Powell. That is correct. Oh, I mean, I, mean, I think Tommy might have got that one as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I always like to make our guests feel welcome because we'd love to have you back on again another time. So, OK, this is important for you, Tommy. This is a chance for a victory. The question that is a joint question, um, Nigel, is always to do with distance. Um, but the good news for you is, is I'm going to ask Tommy mm -hmm. and then you just have to go higher or lower. Okay. So the pressure's on Tommy here. And I think Tommy knows what's coming. From this very seat, how far is it to Sparta Prague Stadium, <laughs> the Letna Stadium, where, of course, uh, Sir Nigel famously played in one of his very first few matches for Watford? Are you going to give me a heads up? Or... I'm going to give you a range yeah. between 750 and 900 miles. It's 824, the way I go. <laughs> 824, the way you go. Might not necessarily be the way I go. Uh, so, Nigel, you get to go whether it higher or lower than, and than 824. Did you go on your bike to, the, to the second yeah, leg? I did, yeah. <laughs> we had to make our own way there. <laughs> um, I'm going higher, but I don't know the answer. Oh, he's gone higher. The correct distance is 820. Oh, what a great effort. So, Tommy, at 824, that's not bad. That's a great uh, effort. Yeah, but the, the road works. Yeah, road there were road works, road. 824. So, it does four mean, miles around. Tommy, you're correct. You've won a game of Ask Tommy. Congratulations. Well done, Tom. Very good. Well, you feel bad, don't you? <laughs> you feel bad. <laughs> I, know, I know that the supporters are just going to torture me now. Yeah. I can't believe it. Can I not, like, you've won? Have you've another won. guess. No, Give me another guess. Okay. Time now for the important questions, of course, which are the ones that come for you. Uh, question number one. Uh, Tommy, how on earth could you beat Sir Nigel? Uh, that's Tommy. No, I'm joking. Uh, it's another one from you on TV. Uh, it says, uh, how cold was it on your debut versus Starter, Sparta Prague? I've only just thawed out. Yeah, well, the, the away leg was absolutely frozen. It was incredible that the game was played. It was, it was on thick ice. There was snow. Uh, I couldn't believe that the game was played and uh, I don't know how they kept their feet but they kept it better than us because we lost 4-0 but I do remember it was absolutely freezing. Yeah, no, massively. And, uh, and how special was that to make your make your debut in that competition? Because that's, that's yeah. an incredible way to make your debut in a, in a UEFA Cup game. Yeah, there was um, obviously the, the uh, Champions League as it is now, um, the European Cup, there was one place and then you know, we finished second in the league, so I got into the UEFA Cup. So, you know, there, there wasn't many opportunities to play in Europe, but yeah, it was so special and, uh, you know, to, to play both legs. It was actually that season, a lot of the young players played because uh, we had a lot of injuries, but if you hadn't signed uh, um, for the club before a certain date, you couldn't play in the competition. So, Warrell Sterling, uh, Ian, Ian Richardson, Jimmy Gilligan, um, they all played in that competition, so it was it was a great time for all the young players, and obviously for myself, uh, being being literally a pro for three days to, to get my opportunity. Do you remember the conversation? I do because um, we always used to train on the morning of the game. Um, that was what the boss did. So um, morning of the game, I was actually in the first team squad because of the the numbers of players who couldn't play and. The boss said, oh, uh, we, we did the training, but we didn't actually do, do much shape. And uh, he said, oh, what are you doing later? I'm coming to the game, boss. Would you fancy playing? Yeah, yeah, of course, boss, I do. So he says, right, OK, go home, get yourself ready, you're playing. And, and, and that was the conversation. Now, it's his way of obviously relaxing me. Probably if he'd have told me the day before, I got nervous. But if I go home, obviously have a bit of a rest and then come back and, and play the game. Wow. That's awesome. Uh, next question comes from Nick uh, and would like to know the best and worst player in training. Mm. Uh, 
well, John Barnes was the best player um, over my career, and ooh, the worst. I, I would have to say Raymond Vega. Okay, why? Um, he would probably save himself for the games is probably the best way to describe him. That's so <laughs> diplomatic. <Gibbo. laughs> That's so diplomatic. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't expect anything else from Gibbo. <laughs> so. I don't know if we've done your best, best and worst, worst in training. In training. Um, Page always trained pretty hard. Yeah. He was pretty solid. I mean, there's different ways of saying who's yeah, who, yeah. who would be it every day. So John yeah. Barnes, uh, actually, as a player, was the best. Um, but there's been a lot of good players who attitudes, as, as Tommy said, and attitudes weren't so good. So that's probably why I said yeah. someone. We'll see, how, see how diplomatic Tommy is now. <laughs> who was the worst player? Worst trainer? Yeah. Nordin Vuta. Because? Uh, I, I never seen him break sweat. No. Did you? No, he didn't, no. I saw him be sick once, actually, when he did the doggies. <laughs> remember his first time he did. We used to do this really hard run, and everyone uh, under the boss would know about this, where you, you, it's 120 metres there and back, and you do three runs, one set. And uh, unfortunately, he really, he was very quick, and he absolutely blasted the first set. But <laughs> when he got to the third set, where we all sort of knew what was coming, he was, he was gone and in the bushes. <laughs> well, because he was so quick, none of us said... Nodding like, calm down. This yeah. is, this we is knew gonna last a while. Well. We, we knew what was coming. Elbow at each other, going, it ain't lasting. <laughs> yeah. He can't do it at that pace. Oh, I love that. Uh, next question comes from Ollie. Uh, how different or similar is Watford as a club now compared to when you were playing? Um, I, I don't know the ins and outs. Obviously, you know, uh, on the coaching side, but certainly the stadium is fantastic, isn't it? You know, the uh, uh, commercial side of it, the hospitality, and the pitch. The pitch, uh, there's no excuses on that pitch, is there? Whereas I had a few excuses when I had the Adidas Crowdfinder on, but um, <laughs> uh, it, that, that's changed massively, you know. Um, but the fans are still the same, you know, they're always here, whatever happens, they're loyal, they stay. Um, but certainly the stadium and the pitch for me. No, that's really, um, thank you so much for your questions. Uh, we've got one final one, which I think is incredibly apt to end the show on this evening, and it comes from Amanda, and she would like to know the best piece of advice that Graham Taylor ever gave you. And I'm going to throw that to both of you. Well, he said he always used to say, give of your best, and I, that sticks with me. So he means that if you've given your best, you're a winner, and I can't ask any more of you, and that's, that, that sticks, with you, sticks with me. Yeah, I agree. That's, it's something that I use all of the time, that, that phrase. Um, I think with the gaffer at Aston Villa, um, he actually released me from Aston Villa, but he said to me, I think you'll make a living out of the game. I'm not sure at what level. And he was right. He was. Certainly was. Um, Tommy, thank you as ever. Um, Nigel, pleasure to have you on the show thank tonight. You. Thank you My so pleasure. much. Um, yeah, real honour to have you in the studio and thanks for being part of it tonight. Um, a massive thank you to every single one of you at home as always who's got involved, whether it's sending a question to our guests or putting a comment on social media. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, make sure if you come into the game tomorrow, you bring your scarves, you sing loud, you share those stories of the boss and we will see you next week on Inside the Hive. <laughs>